had some line dancing at the White House. I wonder if this place, it was so strange. I went, I went in and it was like, uh, it was this line dancing was going on. And I thought it was really cool, you know, went out and I tried to do some this toe tapping. And then I went into the bathroom and this guy walked in with this, with this cowboy hat on and he, uh, he kind of, you know, he lifted up his shirt to go to the bathroom and I saw that he was packing. <laughs> and I saw the gun. And I was like, whoa, they let you in here with that? And it was like a movie. He went like this, he went. He was like this, he went. <laughs> you ain't from around here. <laughs> I swear, it was, it, was, it was a classic line. I was like, oh man, I wish I'd got that on my phone. <laughs> you ain't from around here. But uh, yeah, yeah, I've, 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 you know, I've actually been to Texas a couple of times. I saw the Texas Rangers play in the game, uh, you know. And uh, but you guys have your own t team here, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. The Astros. The Astros. Yeah, okay, brother. And, and, and I mean, have they have they gone to the to the World Series? Yeah. Wow. But they got there. They got there once. What what year was that? 2005. What's your show? That's 2005? <laughs> that was the year. That was a good day, though. Hey, we're still in good day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, well you know, I mean, I mean, listen, like, I, I, out, out of you, uh, who, who are Spartacus fans? <laughs> Spartacus fans, okay. Arrow fans? <laughs> You know, I've, I've been pretty fortunate. I, I have to say that, you know, uh, you know, in becoming an actor, I, I, I guess I had, you know, maybe 10, 15 years of, of just trying to find a foothold, you know, and get an opportunity to, to, to sort of, you know, get there, if you want to call it getting there. You know, like, I guess every every young actor has that, that kind of ambition to want to, you know, get to the point where they're able to be in America, I guess. I mean, I'm from New Zealand. You know, and I lived in Australia, and to think that I would have a career that would bring me over to sit in front of any Americans and speak about <laughs> who I am uh, is, is, is something that still, in a, in a big way, still kind of like seems to me like such an honor, such a privilege, such a, uh, a reward for, for years of putting myself into this, into this art form. But, uh, but you know, I, I have to say that, you know, where my career probably first started going in the right direction was when I met this uh, producer called Rob Tabbitt, who uh, produced Xena. And uh, any Xena fans? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of women screaming. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't hear any, <laughs> we love Xena. <laughs> Maybe another way. But, uh, but you know, uh, Rob Tabbitt, uh, you know, uh, cast me to play uh, Mark Antony in this episode of Xena, and that was back in 1999. And uh, I, remember going, I remember going to the casting and thinking that, that Lucy Lawless was, I mean, there was like, there was a mythology about Lucy Lawless, you know, she was six foot one, you know, all of this stuff, you know, giant, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I was actually in Australia at the time that I, I did the casting, and um, I remember wearing these boots, I wore these boots in my stuck socks in them and everything, so I was like, he's tall as a tree. And I went into the series. And, and I went into this casting and, uh, and they were like, oh, how tall are you? You know, and I was like, oh, I'm six foot two. I was, I was thinking, and they were like, I'm five eleven, right? But, but I thought, I heard you were six foot one. I thought, well, they're not going to cast somebody who's diminutive to her. So, so I went in there and, uh, and I got this role. And then they, they sent me over to New Zealand and, um, I arrived at the wardrobe department and they gave me a pair of pants that were of course three inches too long. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then funnily enough, the, uh, the person who was working for, for the wardrobe department, uh, she's married to my cousin. And she said, she said uh, you know what, when I, when I heard it was a Bennett, you know, because my, my family are all on average about five, ten. She goes, I didn't think we had anybody in the family who was over like six months. <laughs> so, but, it, but just to cut a long story short, in that particular episode, uh, I had this battle scene. It, it just so happened that a guy called Michael Hurst was directing. Uh, Michael Hurst ended up directing me in, uh, in Spartacus as well. 
Uh, Michael Hurst was the actor who played Leolis alongside Hercules in the Hercules series. Uh, he had Zena and Hercules coming in New Zealand. So uh, he was, he was quite, he's, he's always been a very edgy director. And on this particular episode of Xena, um, where we, we pushed the envelope, especially in terms of the fighting and the seriousness of the fighting, uh, usually Xena's dramatics with swords and stuff like that was all pretty much like, you know, Sinbad. Uh, so, you know, it was kind of a fantasy style of fighting, you know, or, uh, you know, so when people fought like, ah, you know, good stairs in between and stuff like that. But it wasn't full on brutal blood lust fighting. And when, when I spoke with Michael about the particular fight scenes uh, that we were having in this, in this, in this episode, I said, oh, listen, can I, can I, like, can we really just go for it? Can we, like, can we fight as though we're, we're really fighting, you know, for our lives and fighting with this strength and whatnot? And, and, and he said, yeah, yeah, look, uh, yeah, this, this episode, when it aired, Xena was always playing at an 8.30 time slot. It got, it got pushed to 9.30 because of the, the, the alteration of violence in, in a Xena episode. It was any time a Xena episode had been pushed into that time slot. I think there was one moment where, uh, in the episode where, uh, where uh, Brutus got his throat slashed, and it was a big slash, you know, and he fell over backwards, and he was like gurgling in his own blood, and then he realized that Xena in the episode was pretending to be Cleopatra, and he, he suddenly realized as he was dying, and he was like on his back, and he went, and it was all, all his blood gurgled in his throat, you know? And so it was quite, it was quite, Bloodthirsty, but for my particular fight beat, I said to all the stunt guys, I said, look, these guys, these swords are made of rubber. So let's let's just hit each other. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all these guys, you know, they're, they're great guys, they're great stunt guys in New Zealand. They're, they'll say yes to anything. <laughs> and, and they want to as well. And so they're like, oh yeah, 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 no worries, man, let's go for it. So I fully went into this fight just like, yeah, you know, like Crixus, you know, I just hit it so hard. I hit it so hard, I was hitting these guys, and they had big chest plates on and stuff like that. But, you know, faces were exposed and things like that, you know. So in the middle of this fight scene, we're all going hell for leather, and these guys are loving it, and I'm loving it, and the, but the safety officer, something, she, she came screaming onto the set, and was like, stop, 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 can't, can't. And we're going, what? And then she said, listen, you, you can't do that, you, you know? You're gonna get, hurt somebody. Like, we didn't listen. We kept on doing it like that. But, but just to make a point of what I'm, what I'm speaking about is that is that years later, like six, seven years later, uh, Rob Tappet, the same producer, he he cast me alongside uh, uh, Josh Hartnett in in the horror movie Thirty Days of Night. Yeah, 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 great, great graphic novel, great adaptation of that. Uh, interesting, though. Who saw 30 Days of Night? Oh, great. Well, well, you know, David Slade, David Slade was, we went and saw Hard Candy, you know, a few nights before we started filming with David, realized that we had a, an incredible director on our hands, and I think his stuff in Hannibal has been just incredible, you know. He's so, uh, you know, yeah, David's just a great director. Um, but I think he got he got a bit hamstrung when it came to 30 Days of Night. Somebody had a lot of opinions. Josh Hartnett showed up for 30 Days of Night with a full beard. Like he looked, he didn't look like Josh Hartnett, do you know? Right, and because of that, Sony told him on the first day of filming that he had to shave. And we were waiting for two hours out in the snow in the South Island of New Zealand because there was a standoff between Josh Hartnett and Sony Pictures. Josh didn't want to shave his beard. And I thought, I mean, we were all in support of Josh, you know, because it was like he, he looked different, you know, he didn't look like the pretty boy. He looked like, he, you, know, you know, the movie, uh, and, and this is where it would have worked, because, you know, the movie The Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing, you know, and there's all those actors all the beards. I mean, you go to, you go to Alaska, you, they're, they're all the beards. <laughs> or it's just part of staying warm or whatever, you know, it's, we're just not giving a shit because you're all the out there. So, you know, but it's part of that, that culture is, is, is that look. And so Josh, I thought it had wanted it perfectly. Anyway, two hours later, he walks onto set. Like, remember, this, remember the, the scene about the phones that were all burnt in the snow? And 
and we're realizing that our town's been put out of contact for some weird reason. Uh, so it was that scene. Anyway, he walked out and he was shaved. And I swear to you, the look on his face, he was so angry, so angry. And when I was just sitting there going, here we go. And he came on and, and you watch that scene closely, you'll notice, watch, watch it. And that one scene, you'll see him clench his jaw about 30 times, just because he was so, so beat off. Um, but there was an interesting thing about that film in that David Slade originally wanted to cast Ralph Fiennes. And so there's a lot of creative, you know, Ralph Fiennes would have made that movie completely different again, you know. I don't know why I'm talking about Ralph Fiennes in their movies. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about it. Never say. But there's a lot of, but anyway, so, so after 30 days of night, uh, you know, we, we, I, I got to this phase in my, in my career where, uh, where I was uh, looking for another, you know, a good role. The WWE cast me in two movies. They came with one movie to Australia, you know, called uh, uh, Not the Condemned. It was the other one uh, with John Cena, uh, The Marine. Yeah. So I was sort of sitting in Australia after doing this Josh Hartnett movie, and uh, WWE had this movie called The Marine, and, and I went and cast for it, and, uh, and, and they gave me that movie, and, and, and they we actually worked so well together that they offered me the following movie called The Condemned with, uh, with Stone Cold Steve Austin. And, and at that stage I was sort of, you know, in these sort of gladiatorial kind of roles, you know, fighting these WWE wrestlers. And um, and a movie came up called The Smashing Machine. Has anybody ever heard of Mark Kerr? Mark Kerr? Yeah. UFC? Yeah, yeah he's, he, was, he was really one of the very, when, when the UFC first started, it had no rules. I mean, you could headbutt, you could be on top of somebody on the ground, headbutt them straight in the face. You could get up and knee them in the face and the elbow. You know, it was, it was very brutal. And there was this guy called Mark Kerr, who kind of took it, he, he took it to another level on steroids as well. Um, I, I saw this documentary one night. Somebody gave it to me at the gym and said, man, you gotta, you gotta check this out. And I, and I watched it. The next morning, my manager rang me. The next morning, she rang me and said, Manu, we've got this movie come through called The Smashing Machine. And they want you to read for Mark Kerr. And I was like, I just watched it last night. And I thought it was the most divine intervention in my career that had ever happened. I couldn't believe it was, it happened like that. Anyway, I, I immediately went and saw this friend of mine who was like a Mr. Australia bodybuilder. And I said to him, I've got to be this big for this role. So he said, okay, well, to be that big, you got to go this side of the fence. I did everything I could possibly do to get this role. I actually got to 105 kilos. I'm like 85. Are you, are you guys in pounds? Yeah. Probably about, probably about two, what's 105 kilos? About 240? 220? 230? Yeah, so I'd be about 180 now. You know, but it was, it was a huge size for me. It was such a big effort physically to get to the to, to win that role over. And I flew to South Africa uh, to film it. And uh, Fedor Emelianenko, who was like this undefeated Russian fighter at the time, was the best in the world at mixed martial arts. He was going to play one of the lead characters as well. And so was another guy called Shogun Rua, yeah, who's, who's like one of the top uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys. And it would have been just a great film to be amongst all of those great gladiators at the time. And um, Jean-Claude Van Damme was meant to play my coach, but he was meant to play the character of John Coleman, uh, who, who ended up in the, in the documentary The Smashing Machine. He ends up going through and winning the title, and Mark Kerr kind of slides off the rails. But dramatically in that script, it was a really good acting role. Anyway, I get to South Africa, like, jacked. And story goes, the Van Damme saw a photo and pulled me out. And so three days before we were meant to start filming, we got a notification that he wasn't going to show up. And the whole film fell over. And I was absolutely devastated. I swear to you, I, was, I put so much effort into it. I, I felt like if I'd got onto the screen at the size that I'd been at, and I don't think I'll ever be able to get back to that size again. I'm 
uh, like, uh, you know, not in my physical twilight years anymore. You know, it's, it would be very difficult to get back to that particular shape. I was, I was just in the peak, you know, and um, anyway, I, I had to go back to Australia and I had no money. And I had to go, a, a mate of mine who, who ran a building company knew what had happened to me. And he said, look, Manu, I, I heard this thing fell over and that you're, you know, you're kind of struggling right now. Uh, I just had my first little baby girl, you know, and I, I just felt like the weight of, of the world on my shoulders. You know, I thought that I'd gotten this role and it was going to get me to Hollywood and all that. It felt like I, I had nothing. I was coming off this stuff that I'd used to get big, which was, you know, a difficult phase in itself. And um, I just, I just, uh, you know, took my friend's offer up to go work on his on his building site. And, and honestly, for several months, I was digging a hole in the backyard with a and, uh, but it was funny when it came down to Spartacus, because the origins of Crixus was that he was a hauler of stone, he was referred to. And for that eight months or ten months that I was working on that site, all I could remember doing was actually carrying buckets full of rubble and stuff over and dumping it in this big dumpster of this, this place. I never, I never lost hope with my career, I just was really put to a test, a massive test at that point. Um, and my manager kept on ringing me. She was going, Manu, Manu, are you still digging the hole? Yeah, 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 it's getting deeper. It's getting deeper. <laughs> She's got, and then she rang me, she rang me one day, and she says, Manu, Manu, I had this, this, this show's come along. It's called Spartacus. And, and I, was, I was like, oh, I remember the old movie, you know, with Kirk Douglas. And I was like, oh, wow. She goes, he has a television series. So they, you know, they, they want you to go and read. So, so I ran, went in and um, there was particular casting agents in, in Sydney. I, I walked in and there was a bunch of 20 year old kids all lined up down the hallway. You know, all going, I am Spartacus. <laughs> <laughs> like, like this young exuberance. I am Spartacus. You know? And I kind of walked in and, and the casting agent said to me, Michael, what are you doing here? I was kind of like, oh, yeah. faith on me. Spartacus thing. She says, yeah, but Spartacus was like 22, 23 years old. They're trying to cast 23 years old, you know, not 35, whatever, you know. And I was guard, I was like, she hit me like she punched me in the arm something like that. My ego was like, oh, I'm going back to the building site. <laughs> anyway, I just, I, 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 I got in and I did my audition. And, uh, you know, uh, it was, it was like, a, I didn't hear anything for a couple of months. For a month at least, and so I was, I was still just doing the work. And, um, but then I, I got this call, and they said, "Oh, Manu, they want you to come in, and they want you to read for that Spartacus uh, show again, but they want you to come in and read for another role. They want you to read for Enemaeus, you know, the one that uh, Peter Mensah played." So I went and I read for that, and they thanked me, and I left. I didn't hear from for another month. And I thought, well, it's gone again, you know? And they remember, Manu, Spartacus wants to read you for another role. They, they, they want you to read for Barker. <laughs> so I went and I read for Barker. And then about a few weeks after that, we got a phone call and they said, they want to fly to America in four days to do a screen test in LA for the role of Barker. I was like, oh, great, great, great. The day before, I was going to fly they rang up and they said, oh, Manu, listen, they decided they're going to kill Barker in, in episode four. <laughs> and so they're going to cast it out of New Zealand. So that one's gone. Like, I'm telling you, it was a roller coaster for Spartacus. <laughs> and then a few weeks after that, this thing went on for, it was, it was, it was torture. A few, you know, a few weeks after that, they rang up and they said, Manu, I've got another role they want you to read for. And I'm like, oh, whatever. <laughs> but Lucretia? <laughs> and they, uh, yeah, and, and my, my manager couldn't even say the name. I remember she was going, like, I, don't, I don't know how to say this because she's German. She went, I don't know how she said it. C R I X U S. Crisis. Crisis. She said, I was like, wow. Okay. okay. And then she goes, yeah, yeah, well, he's the main gladiator that's going to be the antagonist to Spartacus. And, um, you know, I went along and I read for this, this role. And uh, it was like two months 
after I'd been in the room. I was, I was sitting in a zoo, in a bird aviary, with my little daughter, Huya, in a pram in front of me. And I was just, she was asleep, she was asleep. And I was sitting here. My name means, my name Manu means bird, by the way. And here I was sitting in this bird aviary. Huya, and our names combine Manu Huya, means the bird of peace, yeah. which is a real bird from New Zealand that became extinct because of like see the feather in your head. <laughs> <laughs> the Maori chiefs used to wear the long Huya feather in their headdress as a sign of peace. And what happened at the time, because hats were in fashion in Europe at the time, when, when they heard that the chiefs in New Zealand these Huya feathers and so I getting these stories in this magnificent country. Okay. There was a big demand for the Huya feathers, so they killed off the birds, and the birds became extinct in about 1940. So my daughter got the name Huya, uh, about the Manu Huya. But here I am sitting, not, not about your feather, my darling, your feather is beautiful. <laughs> it's synthetic, I know I get it. <laughs> anyway, so I'm, I'm, si I'm sitting, pushing this pram, and I get the, this phone call. And it's, and it's Rob Tapper, you know, this great supporter of mine for, for so many years. And he goes, Manu, he actually, he goes, he calls me Matt, he's from Texas. <laughs> Rob Tapper, he goes, yeah, Manu, <laughs> it's Rob Tapper here. I just want to tell you something. We all really love your audition, okay? <laughs> but I can't offer you the job. Like this whole thing was just like this. I can't offer you the job until uh, until you promise me something. I was like, what? What? And he goes, Yeah. Remember years ago when you did Zener, and you were like, you were like hitting all the stunt guys with the swords. <laughs> this is verbatim, I swear. He said, Well, we can't have you doing that in Spartacus. <laughs> You're not allowed to hit Andy Whitfield, our lead actor. Okay? We gotta keep him safe. You gotta, you know, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to hit him. And I was like, Oh, I, I, I promise, I promise. I swear to you, I hit everybody in that show. <laughs> but he said, Man, welcome to Spartacus. And I'm sitting in that doorway. And you know, it, it, it changed my life. I mean, Spartacus was, uh, I mean, I, I got into acting. Uh, well, first of all, I got into ballet. I'll, I'll give you a background of who I am, just so that you know, because because I don't know, for, for those of you who are Spartacus fans, I, I, uh, I couldn't have hoped for a better role. Uh, there's, you know, the, the, there's been violence and pain and death in my life, and there's been moments of, of victory and reward, and, of course, you know, we all know the matters of the heart, you know, trying to work through that, and, uh, and I couldn't have had a better platform or canvas upon which to try to paint who I am as a, as a person into a character. Uh, you know, when I, was, when I was 15 years old, uh, I lost both my mother and my brother, both died in car accidents, and my girlfriend at the time invited me to do ballet. You know, she said, listen, you know, you can just, just come in and, and feel dancing, you know, it'll help you. And it ended up being amazing for me because I ended up doing a lot of part of dirt work, which is dancing with ballerinas. And because I lost my mother and I just needed this connection somehow with female energy, you know, I could dance and go through this kind of classical rhythm and music with a with a female ballerina very well, you know. And also I was masculine, you know, I was quite a masculine dancer, so you know the, the teachers were like, Oh, you know, you're gonna go a long way, man. You know, you've got this feeling, but you're also, you know, you're physical. Um, and so I almost went to New York and studied ballet um, on scholarship in New York. Uh, at the same time, I was up for the Australian Rugby Union team because I found that if I did ballet, it would take care of my heart, and if I played rugby, it would take care of my anger. <laughs> and that's kind of the complexity of who I am, really, as an artist. I mean, I've had this evolution that's taken me through music and dance and ballet and all 
all this sort of stuff. And then I've had this other side, which honestly, I mean, I'm not proud of some of the things I did in my 20s, but you know, I, I was, I was a, uh, a guy who launched sports and I do a lot of you know, physical sports and then also had a strong fuse, which I had to you know, try to extinguish as I went through my 20s so that I could become a reliable actor. I mean, something about the acting industry is that you know, it, it feeds on your emotion, but you've got to be able to control it all and be reliable with producers. You know, you, you, you know, everybody knows there's a thousand and one actors in Hollywood you've seen go to here and then fall off. They lose it, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a testing industry because of that. But uh, but when I came to Spartacus, you know, Spartacus was the perfect tool for me. One, I had to stay as fit as I've ever possibly been in my whole life. Secondly, they gave me Navia, you know, which was touching fingers through the through the bars, which you know, which was you know reflective of you know so so many things in my in my, in my past. My mother, you know, I mean, there was all this stuff that I layered into that. One of, the th one of the things that I layered into that relationship between Spartacus and Crixus was that when I was in high school, there was a guy called Matthew Sisley, and he had a mullet haircut, and he drove this red little car that had an engine that came through the bottom, you know, those, those rotary engines, whatever, and he'd drive around the neighborhood going, like, <laughs> you know, and of course he knew I was a ballet dancer. So him and me were like at each other, so he, he, you know, he hated me. Like he, he gave me such a hard time of, uh, I was actually a break dancer before he was about like this, but this guy, this guy would give me such a hard time and we were at each other's throats. Like literally every day at the, at the bus stop outside the school, me and this guy would be in some form of either staring at each other or going, yeah, you know, whatever. We actually never had a fight physically. But it was always so close, and I can't think of anybody who was more my direct enemy than this person. Uh, when I was in the car accident with my mother, I was thrown out the side of the window. Some people ask me whether my scars were put on for the shows. Well, these scars all across my face here, they're real. That was from going through the glass, and that was from hitting the road. The dark stuff in the, on the corner of my eye is actually pigment from the tar on the road. Actually stained pigment in my skin. But um, from that accident, I was in a coma for like a week in hospital. And um, when I woke up in the hospital, finally, when I came conscious, Matthew Sisley was beside my bed. My worst enemy. The guy I hated. The guy that wrote on the, the, the board in the, in the classroom, Manu Bennett, uh, you know, he's a, he's a black bloody, he wrote this most abusive thing on, on, on the, the, the school blackboard once that I can't believe we didn't have a physical fight. But, you know, he, he, he wrote this and I was so abused by it. But I couldn't believe at the moment that I woke up from this coma, this person, I, I thought I was having a dream. I woke up and there's Matthew Sisley with his mother. But he wasn't looking at me like he'd ever looked at me before. He was looking at me like, like he cared. And I don't know where that came from. But I found out. Because then that Matthew Sisley's mother had passed away when he was a young boy. And all of a sudden he identified with me. And all of a sudden we were friends. And we became best friends. I was the best man at his wedding. I still go and see him at least once every year or two years talks. I mean, you know. And when I read the script about Crixus and Spartacus, I saw that story. And so I started it off at the bus stop. You know those opening scenes in Spartacus where I was confronting him in the, in the, uh, in the washrooms, in the bathhouse. You know, I was just in his face. I was just <laughs> trying to copy Matthew Sisley and I. And I knew that they were going to cook it. You know, I knew that the story arc was going to end up in this sort of brotherhood thing, so... I, had, I had actually, you know, I had, I had this really great story that started to work in such a great way, like, you know, like, I remember, I remember at first hearing, like, blogs that were coming through or whatever, um, you know, in terms of the fans responding to Crixus, and I'm going, oh, what an ass man, we hate him. You know, he's such a dick. <laughs> you know, and I was loving it. <laughs> I was loving it. I was going, yeah, I, I, like just like I was, but I knew I had this card in my hand, 
and I knew how to use it. I knew how to play it. I knew that I would end up beside the hospital bed of every viewer at home. And I'd suddenly go, mm -hmm. <laughs> And then they'd have to go through all the layers, you know? It was, it was such an interesting ploy. And, and I ployed it and it worked. You know, because, you know, I, I meet a lot of people, uh, especially people who hurt, you know, people who have had pain, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, vets from Afghanistan or, or Iraq. I, I get a lot of those military boys. The military, obviously, were, were, were big fans of Spartacus because it's a story about brotherhood. You know, it's a story about standing beside your brother when they die in the arena. And you've just got to keep moving forward, you know, so there was some reality that they could escape to in our entertainment and still feel something that they were going through themselves. I get a lot of these stories told to me by, by military people about how they, they would watch it whilst they were deployed. Um, but, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, it was a, it was a very emotional character, a, a roller coaster ride, and, uh, and you know, it, it was... It was my proudest achievement, you know, it, it really was. And, and, and in, in so many ways it was, ah, I don't know, I was blessed. I was just blessed, you know? I mean, all those moments where I, where I thought, you know, I'm going to like, I'm being on the side of the road thinking I was dying, you know, knowing, knowing my mother and I could You know, it's just, it's amazing that, that you know, through, through some adversity such as that, like really bad adversity, that, that I, I'm sitting here now talking about how, how those emotions went through that box at home and you guys actually appreciate it enough to actually walk into this room to come and say hello to me. So I, want, yeah, I just want you to know that about who I am. Just so you know that it's just not a performance. An acting, you know. We're together on that? <laughs> okay. Okay. So when Spartacus finished, um, well, actually, no, no. Two weeks before Spartacus finished, uh, we got a phone call from Wellington, you know, from Peter Jackson, asking whether whether I could come down and do this role of Unsock. And uh, another funny story, just for behind the scenes stuff. Uh, I'd I'd read for Arzog about a year and a bit before that particular date, and they'd flown me down there. And I thought I was in for the running because they, they flew me down to Wellington to, to do a screen test. And, um, but I didn't hear from it for it until eight months later. Uh, who remembers in Spartacus when the Germanic tribe came and joined us? Saxa and uh, remember the Germans, the Lugo, yeah, those characters. Well, remember the guy Sedulus who was seven foot tall and tried to rape Navia and he got his face cut off? I went to high school with that kid. <laughs> he was seven foot tall. We called him Bones. Let me tell you the story of Bones. <laughs> Bones, we called him Bones because he was so skinny. He was like six foot five, six foot six in high school. And just like skinny, he's just walking around the playground like this. <laughs> and, and people were big on him, you know. And uh, one day we were sitting in Newcastle, Australia. We're, we're all sitting in the quadrangle, you know. And uh, Bones is walking through the middle of what he does. And suddenly this guy from the year above us, this little sort of smart, smarmy guy, you know, a bit of a bully guy, walked up to Bones in the middle of the playground and kind of got in his way and got in his face. And we're all just watching, going like, oh, Bones is going to get picked on again, you know. And all of a sudden, Bones just went, <laughs> with his two big, lonky, blanky arms, you know. And he knocked this guy flat on his ass. <laughs> And I swear to the universe stopped spinning. <laughs> and a lightning bolt came down from like Zeus and hit him in the head. And he turned around and he saw everybody had seen him. <laughs> and Bones was never Bones again. <laughs> I swear to you, he became, he became Thor. I mean, he did, literally. Like literally, he, he, he was in the rugby team two weeks later. Like head strapped and run down the sideline, and we were running, go, Bones, Bones, give us the ball. My name's Shane. Shane, give us the ball. Several, for several years after school, I, I, I went overseas. I won, this, I won this modeling competition when I was in high school, and it gave me a trip to London. It took me overseas and got me away from the, the 
the sort of some of the misery that I was feeling because my mother and stuff like that, but it gave this opportunity to see the world. It was one of the best opportunities I got as well. Um, I was overseas, then I went back to Newcastle and I went to like a place called The Brewery and uh, that was like this newly opened uh, sort of bar and Bones was on the door as a doorman and he was like mass, I mean he was, you know, he'd gone to the dark side. <laughs> he'd gone to the big side, he'd gone to the big side and he was, he was like this and I was like, Jesus, dude, what are you doing? Anyway, cut a long story short, because it, 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 all my stories are long, and I can never cut them short. But jump forward a few more years past that, he got cast as Sedulous in Spartacus. And when he showed up on set, I was like, Shane, dude, bones! <laughs> Mate, I can't believe you've, 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 you've come into the acting industry. And he said, yeah, yeah, I was going to do WWE, but then I tore my knee, and then, you know, I got involved in some castings, and they cast me, this is my first role. I was like, oh cool, come into my house for dinner, bro. So he came out of my house and was sitting and having dinner and uh, and he's he's like, oh, I just got another acting role. And I was like, what? He goes, I just got cast as Arzog. That's how I looked, like you. I, I think I was a bit of some food in my mouth and I went. I was like, really? But, but then, you know what, a joy flooded through me, and I went, oh, Bones, cool brother, well done, I went for that wrong motherfucker. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 fantastic. You know what, I never told him that I went for the role, and I thought I was such a dick. But I just didn't want to, I didn't, you know, like, you know, I was cruciless, and he was searching for something, I'd tell him I went for the <laughs> Anyway, he, um, he ended up going and shooting that whole film. You know, if, if you watch the making of Arzog on YouTube, you'll see uh, them, you know, you'll, they, they reference him as being that they say that originally Arzog was cast as an actor in a, in a suit. But then Peter Jackson made the decision to make a CGI character to give it more detail. If, if you watch Lord of the Rings, you'll notice that, you know, Lawrence McCord McCorday and some of the other boys that I know from back in New Zealand, um, or Maoris, by the way. By the the orcs, I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, they're big boys. But, but anyway, in Lord of the Rings, when he came close on an orc's face, you know, it was just, it was kind of like the masks, they're, they're not that animated. They're good, but they're not that animated. So if you come in close, you'd sort of go, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> You know, I mean, there's not much more you can do. You know, so I'm imagining that in the in the movie, you know, he would have been on the back of the wild, which was actually a green pommel horse, and you know, when he must have it. Anyway, he, 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 and he would have been like, <laughs> you know, uh, somehow when it came to the end of the movie, Peter Jackson looked at the footage and realized that it wasn't working. The Arzog character wasn't working. I mean, David Prowse in Star Wars, everybody knows that story? He acted in the suit, and he had a Welsh accent, which just didn't sound right at all. If you go on YouTube and watch that, he's like, Take the princess to the Death Star! <laughs> you know, it's not, and, you know, it's not, do the do, you know, it's not that deep voice. So they got James Earl Jones to come in and, and, you know, masterfully fill up what that character's meant to be. In this one, I guess the choice was made to remove the whole performance and to CGI the character in using motion capture, the same as Andy Serkis was used for. So they went back through their tapes, and uh, luckily I, I was acknowledged by Peter as having the right presence to play Arzog. So in order to make a seven-foot orc, you know, a giant orc, they brought me in and put me in a leotard with balls all over it. <laughs> like, have you ever seen Andy Serkis doing Gollum? God, tell me, name any one of you guys, tell me how comfortable you are in a leotard. <laughs> and whether you feel masculine. Because I swear to you, when they dressed me up in this thing and I walked out, I felt like the gimp. <laughs> Where's that German party? I'm coming. <laughs> and, but it was, it was, it was, it was a really, really weird 
myself when I first came out to play Arsenal. You know, I sort of came out this like, <laughs> yeah, it's showing, isn't it? <laughs> and I got this, you know, this this tight bodysuit on, and I actually thought that I'll look at me and go like, it's not that big, is he? <laughs> like, how's he going to look like the orc? And then I had a screen like this, okay. And if I looked at the screen, I could see like a semi-rendered version of Arzog. And I'd look at him, and he, you know, it, it, was, it looked like the big grey orc, but it was kind of like a, just a very, very early interpretation of him, in terms of the way that they'd drawn the character on this, giving you a, a resemblance of him. So, when I looked at it, if I started walking like me, he would go like this, he'd go like... <laughs> Okay, that doesn't look right. <laughs> and if I turned my head, it was like, okay, that's, no, he doesn't look big enough, eh? So, so I actually had to start, I'd spend about 40 minutes before I filmed every day actually looking at the screen and kind of like going, Obakti <laughs> Una. Actually filling him out was like really having to fill him out, you know? And it was, it was such an inter interesting process. You know, and, and then as it ended up, all of the initial stuff that they do was all about the movement, about... The one, the one thing that's easier about motion capture is that they're only concentrating on you. You know, if, if you're shooting to a camera and there's background and lighting and extras and costume and a whole bunch of other stuff that can deviate what you're meant to get, then there's a whole... Then you, then you cut and you retake and you retake and you retake. If I do the movement properly for, for Arzog, and then I'm a bit of a movement specialist, really, with the dance background and sport and stuff like that. If I get it right, I usually do it, take, get it in one or two takes. So Peter was, Peter was like, yeah, it's fantastic, let's move on. And, and so I would do one movie in about, I'd finish one movie in two days. It wasn't good for the payback, trust me. <laughs> I was on a daily and I was like, I thought this was going to take months. <laughs> Peter, take his coins and go, there you go. <laughs> but uh, but you know it was it, it really was such a such an interesting character to play and then and then you know to to actually go to like the London premiere of the Hobbit <laughs> it was classic that's the one thing that bugged me most about it but it's on the first on the first Hobbit movie I was involved in Arrow and when I was on Arrow. Um, and I'd done the, we'd already moved past the, uh, the island scenes and it was bringing me to the point where I was coming to the city and they told me that I was going to be really wealthy, that, that Slade was going to be really stylish and an orange suit and, and I said, oh really, can you drive a Lamborghini? <laughs> and the production kind of laughed at me and they said, oh, um, you know, it's not, <laughs> that's, not, that's not in our budget. So I immediately went down to Lamborghini in Vancouver and it just so happened that when I went there, the CEO from Italy was coming across to, to launch the Huracan. And they invited me, I, you know, I sort of got it and I chatted them about what I do, and they said, oh, why don't you come for a drive with us up to Whistler? We're taking about 20 Lamborghinis up there. So I went for a drive with these guys. And, um, and I, then I spoke to the CEO of Italy. I said, look, I'm playing this like, he's like, he's not a villain altogether, but he's like, he's like, you know, this very, you know, well-known and respected character from the DC comic world. And they bring me into the into the story now as though I'm the epitome of wealth now. And I'd, I'd love him to have a black Lamborghini Aventador. And this Italian guy just went, sure. <laughs> Give him the keys to the car. <laughs> I like it, I like it. <laughs> Two more paroli and give him the keys to the car. <laughs> and yeah, I was like, wow, well, really? So that's why, you know, you know that scene, that scene in Arrow? You know, when we leave them, I walk out of the mansion and I get to that black Lamborghini. <laughs> uh, I, I, that was, I got that car. <laughs> I was going to make sure he had that black Lamborghini. I actually went back to the production and I said, okay, listen guys, I'm going to buy that car, then I'm going to lease it back to you guys so that I can use it for the next four episodes, <laughs> four series. That didn't work out. But, um, but uh, yeah, it just so happened that Lamborghini, I started this relationship with them and they, they, they gave me a yellow Lamborghini Super Ligaria to drive to the first Hobbit premiere. And uh, I pulled up, I remember pulling up at the premiere and the bloody camera that was filming everything, if you, if you were watching it live, they cut to a commercial and the camera was sweeping over and if you watch the live footage of the opening 
ceremony for that particular first premiere, as it's sweeping around the top and it turns to black, you see the nose of the yellow Lamborghini pull in. No, and then it goes black and it goes black. <laughs> They say, oh, and it looks like uh, we've got some uh, actors arriving now. Mano Bennett's just about, oh, he's running across, and that showed me running away from the car <laughs> to go and sign some autographs. So the whole thing is there, this kind of like, and then I rang up Lamborghini, and I was going, oh, sorry guys, I was meant to, you know, the whole thing was meant to be out there, you know. And they said, that's okay, we'll give you, I'll tell you what, the next one we'll give you the, uh, we'll give you the, uh, uh, what is it, the, um, everybody before the hurricane was the, Google, Google. <laughs> Siri, what the hell's the latest model of Lamborghini? Um, anyway, they were going to give me the latest two Lamborghinis for the last two Hobbit movies, but uh, in London they pulled it on me. They said I had to remind them to blank it out like everybody else. But I have the hue kind of like, now, I so I don't know why I'm telling you this story. I just love Lamborghinis. Um, Oh, the Aventador, yeah, 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 not the guy out of, yeah, come on, but the Aventador, yeah. But, uh, but anyway, so, so you know, uh, I then ended up, you know, after, after of course, after Arzog, I ended up in, in Vancouver. Uh, funny thing about that was that, uh, for those of you who might know, uh, when Andy Whitfield, you know, when Andy Whitfield, uh, uh, you know, was first diagnosed with his illness, with the cancer, uh, they wrote the prequel, and we did the prequel over a period of a, a few months, and that was meant to give Andy some time to go through chemo and whatnot. And, uh, and then um, we were about to start the second series, and Andy was informed that, you know, he'd come back, at which point our, our, um, our production was meant to have been cancelled at that stage, and everybody felt that that was going to be the, the, the result for the show. But then Andy said, listen, you know, Andy and Stephen and I had a conversation and they said, recast, get somebody else to do the role. And Andy, Andy said, he fully supported that. So they went out and uh, they did rounds of casting and it ended up that three people came to New Zealand uh, to, to audition for the new Spartacus role. And one of them was Stephen Amell. It was Stephen Amell, Liam McIntyre, and one guy who I'm not going to name who came from New York. Got there. I thought he was actually the. I actually thought he was going to get the role. He was dark hair, like he had, he had brown hair, but he had been on a big series in, in New York, and he arrived. And I actually said to him, I thought, I said, dude, I, I think you're in, in, in. But I wish I hadn't said that because he went out that night to a bar in Auckland and started yelling out, drunk, in the middle of this bar, I am the new Spartacus, <laughs> with like members of our makeup team and it all got back to the producers. That guy got flown out of New Zealand the next day. Like, they sent him up, like, I don't, I don't know how. They took that very seriously. So that guy was out, and it was down to Stephen and Mel and Liam. And Liam, Liam got the role, you know. But, you know, I mean, in, in the in the unrolling outcome of things, I you know, I think that Liam was right for that role, and Stephen wasn't right for that role, but Stephen's right for Arrow, you know what I mean? And so the funny thing about when Arrow came up was that I was um, in LA and I saw the billboards with Stephen Amell on it. And then I got called in for an audition and I was going, oh, it's Stephen Amell. And then I went, oh, I got called in. When I got called in for, for the audition for, for Arrow, who's heard about this audition process? Do you think anyone? Has anybody else heard about how I auditioned for Arrow? I just got back from Kuwait. Remember I told you the military guys, I'd just done a USO tour in Kuwait, and when I was there, this special forces guy, uh, I'd been asking who was the Rambo. I said, who's the guy here who's seen the most action and everything? And there was this one guy called Knight. And, um, and they said, oh, Knight, that guy over there with the bald head, he's, he's seen it all. So I hung out with him. I just, I just wanted to, you know, I guess as an actor, I wanted to know the emotional sort of capacity of a man like that. And uh, there was one time where I was standing with Knight in front of all of these Marines, all these soldiers, and um, and uh, I was talking to them, and I, and I said to him, you know, like, 
what, what are the stealth moves? I mean, what are the physical hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff that you guys have to do? Like, say, if you've got to go on a stealth mode, and, and, and you know, I mean, instead of shooting, what do you do? And so Knight grabbed me in this chokehold in front of everybody and started choking me out. And I was, like, within seconds, I was going. And I, was, and I grabbed him as hard as I could by the balls. Because <laughs> I didn't think he was going to go that hard. And he's going, and I was like, oh, and I was just, I was starting to go. And I was going, Whoa. and he told me he couldn't feel himself for like a day afterwards. <laughs> so I, I went for it. I, I was like, if you're going to play this game, bro, I'm coming down as well. <laughs> So when I, when I when I got to LA a few and this is only several days later, um, I got called in for this arrow audition. And, and I walk in and I'm sort of, you know, reading this script, it was a cold read, and it said, you know, it wasn't Slade Wilson, it was called Holloway or something, was, the, the character was called something else, but it said he he drops down from the ceiling behind Oliver and grabs him in a chokehold. <laughs> serious at this particular audition, eh? everyone was trying to be military guys, they were all kind of, you know, they were all walking around in the hallway going like, oh, you got 10 seconds, get to show me something, and all these, all these guys were being really macho, nobody's looking at each other, it was all cold stairs, like 15 acres in the hallway, just going, I'm the top. <laughs> anyway, so I just really, I really sort of thought, you know, I've got to commit myself to this audition, I'm going to give it everything. So I walked in and, and like the key, the guy that was in the room was the director and the camera operator, and you know, and, and uh, it was reading. The, it was also reading the lines. And I, I said, uh, no, no, sorry, he was he was camera operating and the director was reading the lines. And I said, listen, can can I have the guy from behind the camera come in front of the camera so I can hold him in the chokehold? And he's like, do you mind? <laughs> well, the biggest mistake of his life. <laughs> and so. You gotta understand what's going through my mind is Jean Claude Van Damme, motherfucker. <laughs> just a whole bunch of stuff of my past just crept up inside of me, and I was like, "You gotta get this role." <laughs> my first, my line was, "You got ten seconds to tell me something I believe, kid, or I'm gonna cut out your throat box." Do you remember that in that first episode? <laughs> So I leaned in on him, and, I, and as I leaned in, I think the problem with this choke was is you lean in, and it actually blocks the blood off your brain. <laughs> and I'm, you got 10 seconds to tell me something I believe, kid, or I'm gonna cut out your throat box. At which point, at my audition in Hollywood for Arrow, this kid fell unconscious. <laughs> Is this part of the scene? <laughs> my first words that came out of my mouth. And the director said, no, I, I think he choked him out. <laughs> now, I thought at that moment that I'd never get an audition in LA ever again in my life. I thought I was really kind of like in big trouble. And I went, kid, you okay? You okay? And he started coming too, and he was like, and I went, oh, yeah, you okay? So they're only out for a couple of seconds. And I said, come on, come on. And, I, and he got up, and then the director said, and he, said to the, he said to the young kid, he said, you okay? And the kid was like, oh, yeah, 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 I just passed out. And he said, go, go wash your face in the bathroom. He told the kid, he said, go, go to the bathroom and wash your face. Thanks, mate. Right, of course, you guy. Thank you. I just looked at the director and really expected to get kicked out. And I, I said, "Listen, I, I you know, I, 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 I apologize, but to be honest, I've just been in Kuwait with special, this is a special forces guy. I was just there with special forces guys, and the guy who was a badass out of all of them taught me that move three days ago. 
And obviously it works. <laughs> and this, this, car, this casting director looked at me and he went, it was perfect. <laughs> come, come and take a look. And I went there and I was watching the back you know, of the screen and we were watching it and this kid's eyes were like, He's passed. Oh, oh, he's gone. There we go. That's the moment. His lights went out. Well, there he is. And he drops out of frame. He drops out of frame. And I'm like this, and I'm like this. <laughs> this is on film. This is being held on film at a, at a casting agency in LA. I hope, they, I hope they're going to release it at some stage. Uh, it looks like I'm going to get cut out of here. I, got, I think the next group are coming in. Uh, yeah, listen, I, I, I'm. I've just started a new show called, well I've just finished the first series of a new show called Al, uh, called Shannara, Ed Shannara, uh, based upon the Terry Brooks films. Very ambitious project by MTV, which is not known for making, you know, any major, major TV dramas, but, but hey, neither was Stars when Stars made Spartacus. So I'm hoping that their gamble is going to work for myself and the other wonderful cast members that I'm working with, including Austin Butler, Poppy Drayton, John Rhys Davies, uh, you know, a good lineup of, of, of talent. Uh, there's, a, there's a trailer out now, if you look up Shannara, uh, you'll see the trailer. They, they're going for basically the Lord of the Rings Hobbit look, uh, you know, in, in, te in translating Terry Brooks' uh, Shannara Chronicles series. Uh, I'm proud of it. Uh, I play a, 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 a druid called Alanon. Uh, he's, 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 he's like Gandalf meets Crixus. <laughs> and uh, I've really enjoyed the process. So that comes to air in January. Uh, and that'll be my next project you guys will get to see. Uh, I hope I've given you just a little bit more of an insight about who I am, rather than just that guy on the screen. Um, I'll be downstairs for the rest of today and tomorrow. And uh, if you want to come and have a chat, come and have a chat. Uh, I, I really, really, really appreciate having anybody who follows me and thinks my work is okay because it's come from a lot of years of life and uh, to finally sort of stand in front of you guys that look at me through a box and, and see you face to face. Thank you, it's an honor. Cheers.